So I want to introduce myself. My name is Gloria Cardinal. I'm Cree. Um, my roots are really, really in um, northern Alberta, although I've never lived up there. And I've been doing legal advocacy work for about four years. I took the training through the Law Foundation. And um, I do all of my advocacy at the Indigenous Community Legal Clinic, which is at 148 Alexander Street. We're just in Vancouver. We're just on the outskirts of Gastown. And all of our work is, is for low-income Indigenous persons. And so um, I've been asked, along with Russell, to give you a present today, today on updates on indig Indigenous class actions. So what we're going to do first, I'm going to talk a little bit about the 60s scoop. Um, we won't talk too much on that, but um, it'll, I'll just kind of briefly go over when it started, when the deadline was, and what that looked like for the ICLC over the last three years, really, because the deadline was in August 2019. And then Russell's going to uh, come in and talk about the Federal Indian Day School class action. And then after Russell, then I'm going to do another section called aftercare. Because a lot of times when we're doing file work with our clients and we open, we open, uh, we open that work, um, our clients continue to come back and it could be for various reasons. So when we talk about aftercare, it is after we've closed the file, we've done the work that we promised the client to do, but there always ends up being something else coming down the road. So I'm going to... Uh, let Russell introduce himself, and then we will. Hello, I'm Russell Nesbitt. Um, uh, I'm mixed Cree, sorry, Métis, Cree, and uh, European ancestry. I just graduated law school in May, and I've been articling. I'm the articled student at the Indigenous Community Legal Clinic. I also, during my law degree, I did a four-month practice at the clinic as part of uh, UBC has a program in which students can do work and gain credits. Um, and so that's one of the main ways that the clinic provides legal work to individuals. Uh, at the clinic, we primarily do criminal, Indigenous, and family law matters, um, and some other things as well. Uh, indigenous include, we do letters of administration, we do Indigenous class actions, and many more. Okay, so we're going to start out doing um, a little bit. I've only got a few slides on it, but the next it's going to talk. We're going to talk about the 60s scoop class action, and some of you may not have been, been involved with it, but you may have clients who come in with help because they've had to have other additional documents sent in. So um, the settlement. I'm just reading a statement from the application form, and it says the settlement provides a payment to any registered Indian or person eligible to be registered or Inuit person who was adopted or made a permanent ward and was placed in the care of non-Indigenous foster and adoptive parents in Canada. And the dates that they had to have been taken out of their family was these dates that are along the bottom line there. So this online process began in the fall of 2018, which is when we began to help our clients fill out and submit the application form. So at the deadline, which was August 2019, the ICLC had probably helped anywhere between 100 to 150 people apply for this class action. And, you know, at that point, we thought, OK, it's we, we've finished because when we open up a file, we, we agree to help our clients apply. So a lot of our clients are coming in and their reading skills aren't great. They don't understand the wording of the application form. And so one of the things that one um, important thing to remember when you are handling any Indigenous class action, the thing that you need to do is read the settlement agreement. The settlement agreement is what's going to have every answer that you need for your clients moving forward. The 60 scoop class action, the settlement agreement was probably about 200 pages. And I didn't read the entire 200 pages because a portion of it was schedules and um, different things in relation. So I would read, I read probably most of it, but when, when I got to the different schedules, then I read what I needed to for the purpose of what my clients needed. And so this is the thing, like our clients have barriers with reading. 
with understanding long documents. There's not one of our clients who's going to to come into the clinic and read 200 pages of document. There's just no way that never happens. And so that's why we are the people who are here to do that on behalf of our clients. It also, as a, as a legal advocate, it gives you the tools to properly do the job of helping fill in the application form because you've read the fine print. And that is very key. So um, the next thing, um, I just want to say you are your client's eyes because a lot of times they cannot, they don't see what they need to see. The, all they hear is something from the news or they have a friend who said, you know what, uh, if you were scooped, during these dates, um, you you should apply for this. That's all they know. And so when they come in your do- in our doors, we are giving them all of the explanation for the class action, the parameters of the class action and what that means. And we're helping them. To, we're, we're saying, according to your narrative, do you fit into this class action? So a lot of our a lot of what we do at the ICLC is that we focus on the narrative. Our our clients tell the story. And that's actually what is the hard work of doing class actions is listening to the stories because they're very traumatic. And so um, we try and do trauma-informed lawyering. We try and do self-care around trauma as much as possible because we are listening to that narrative all the time. Um, And then the next thing about any class action, read the application form very carefully. Read it out loud. Go into like before you help any person with an application form for 60 scoop class action, it was four pages, fairly straightforward. But in reading this sentence, like some of the clients, this is the very first sentence on that application form. And it says, registered Indian or person eligible to be registered. Some people are not registered, but yet they wanted to apply. And then we're the ones that had to say, um, you can apply, but you actually have to prove that you're eligible to be registered. And that's where the work happens. So the clinic as, as the clinic, we would open this file for a person, even if they weren't registered. And then we would do the research of digging into their background to see what community could they be connected to. And we actually help people get registered during this process. So it's not just like a one page. There's work that we create in a class action that's not just helping fill out the application form. It actually becomes so much more. Um, Okay, so this is actually, I've taken this from the website and this is as of September, 2022 on 60 Scoop Settlement. And it said, it says, this is the final update from the website dated September, 2022. And you see here here that they still have, and I'm looking at the bottom three claim numbers. Claims rejected, but with the right to reconsideration is 157. Claims determined as requiring more information, 348. And claims being actively assessed, 894. We have some of those files at our office, parts of these numbers. We're still trying to work with clients who we've we put in their application in August 2019 or previous to that, we are still waiting for a decision. And do you know how discouraged people get after waiting three years? I know that you've talked to many clients, they get very discouraged. So a lot of our work is around managing our clients' expectation, trying to be very compassionate when they come in once a month to call Collectiva for an update. It's a lot of work for us to do that. And yet they're still waiting. They don't know. So even three years after the the deadline, they they are still waiting. So this is is just part of the challenge of working with class actions because we don't know when it's going to be completely done. And right now it isn't because right here from these three numbers, you've got eight, 12, about 1,400 people that they are still determining if they are going to be eligible. So it it is not still, it is not completed yet. So I wanted to put this picture up about um, for some of our clients. Um, So this, this picture was taken in August 20, both of these pictures were taken in August, 2022, when the final checks were received by these two clients. We actually used our address for only about seven clients and we were mailed those checks in August. And then, it was just like last week, we actually gave out the final 
60 scoop check. So I got to bang the drum in the office and it was a great moment because it's like, you know what, we're done. And there are like one, like I said, there are one or two that haven't been assessed, but most of the work, 99% of our work with 60 scoop uh, class action is now complete. Uh, the first payment was 21,000 in June, 2021. The final payout was issued in August for $4,000 and the total payout was $25,000. So I wanna bring um, Russell up to the floor and he's gonna take over and talk a little bit about Federal Indian Day School Class Action. Um, hello, so yes, I will be talking about uh, the Federal Indian Day Class Action Lawsuits. Please, please feel free, if you have any questions during my presentation, to raise your hand. Um, I'd be more than happy to answer them then or uh, during question period at the end. So this is, yeah, as, as we said, Gloria and Russell. Um, so the history of the Indian Day schools. So in 1920, there were about 247 day schools in Canada and a total enrollment of around 7,500 students. Uh, the government of Canada operated and established 700, around 700 Indian day schools over the years. Um, the total students between 1920 and 2000 were about 200,000 First Nations, Inuit, and Métis children. Um, certain abuses were committed um, during these children's stay at the school. And so unlike residential schools, Indian day schools, the children would get to go home at the end of the night. Um, whereas at residential schools, the children stayed all the time. Uh, so that's the significant difference between Indian day schools and residential schools. Um, and so um, if you go online, you can see numerous anecdotal accounts of the types of things that happened to children while they were at school. Um, in one quote, you always hit with something strapped, uh, pieces of wood, rulers, yardsticks, chalks thrown at you, erasers thrown at you. You were pushed around, said Dennis Diabo. And so these kind of things were very common when I was interviewing individuals who were uh, making an application to the Federal Indian Day Class Action Lawsuit. And things, the, there was a range of... Uh, situations that happened. On the form itself, there's five levels, um, five being the most atrocious actions and one being uh, the least. For a level one claim, you don't really need any evidence. You just need to be able to prove that you went to the school, which and the schools are listed on the Schedule K. Uh, the only caveat to that is that your attendance at the school has to be within the specific days and specific specific dates that the class action deemed that those schools were run by the federal government. Uh, so we have another quote here. We weren't allowed to speak Haida, not even mention the word Haida, uh, Wilson said. We weren't allowed to draw. We weren't allowed to sing and dance. We weren't allowed to talk about anything about Haida culture. And if they disobeyed, Wilson said that they were whipped across the face and sometimes whipped across the back. This was happening throughout my kindergarten, grade one, two, and three, he recalled. So these these things happened, uh, especially around culture. Uh, students, I've had numerous clients state that they weren't allowed to speak their language, that they weren't able to teach their language, that when they went home, they weren't able to speak with their grandparents. Usually their parents had gone to either residential schools or Indian day schools, so they did not have their parents to speak their traditional language. And sometimes even if the parents or grandparents knew their traditional language, they wouldn't speak with their children because they knew that it would only harm them in the long run. Um, and so these accounts regarding um, punishments, if you uh, spoke or went against the, the nuns or the priests or the teachers that were there, um, these are very live and real and are shared amongst many individuals who uh, I asked questions to. Um, so the federal class action loss, uh, lawsuit timeline. So it began in around 2009 uh, with Gary McLean. And in May of 2016, um, they started working on it more. And in 2020, 
of January 13th, um, the application process began. And so the application process uh, ended in uh, June of July 13th of this year. However, there has been an extension form. Uh, likely, uh, they did not state why, but it's likely due to COVID and a lot of situations. Our clinic uh, was closed. We weren't closed, but we weren't able to do in-person intake. Whereas now we, uh, at the clinic, we heavily rely on in-person intake. All, we have clients coming in uh, day to day who don't have appointments. We have walk-in hours between on Monday and Wednesday. So on those days, that's a significant amount of time that was going to clients who may have just heard about us on the street or just saw our clinic and walked in. Though those types of clients wouldn't have been able to get assistance when it was COVID and many individuals were working remotely. Um, so yes, the last official day to apply was July 13th. Um, however, there is an extension form and there are certain criteria that come with the extension form. Um, and so officially now the extension form um, within the parameters of, the, of Deloitte allows for individuals to apply for an extension. Uh, whether they will be accepted is unknown. Um, and so that extension is January 13th, 2023 at 11.59 p.m. So due to the lengthy process and uh, just how long it takes, we have no information. I've called Deloitte numerous times asking what kind of things will be accepted. They're very reluctant to have given me any information. I'm unsure if anyone else here has had any success with that. Um, further, uh, asking about additional documents, I have asked them if, you know, individuals, clients don't have those documents right now when they're working on it, especially for clients who are applying as a representative for a deceased individual. Those Deloitte has stated to me, um, like not legally, I guess, but through one of their workers that like they recommend that everyone get their documents in by January 13th, 2023. Um, whether what will happen after that is unsure, but no, I ha we have not had any successful applications regarding an extension. Um, they, I've not seen any examples of what kind of extensions would be allowable. Um, so for us, it's kind of just a shot through the dark and trying to bolster the situation as much as we possibly can uh, because of how unsure the process is. And I'm unsure if anyone has been rejected or what that kind of rejection would look like. So about this matter, um, we have clients who right at the moment are just hearing about Indian Day School class action for whatever reason. So we use that as a reason. It's like they just didn't know about the process. We're helping them apply as soon as possible. Um, that's all we can do, right? So we hear some people, um, another thing that happens very commonly with our client group is because of substance use issues and memory related issues, they just don't follow timelines very well. And so we're trying to put that into the, the, the extension request because it's a way to, I mean, that's just a real life situation. And you know, I've made the same appointment with one woman every two weeks for the last four months. And said, you know, now I'm like getting panicky, like she has to finish this up because we were we were going to finish in July and it just didn't happen. Right. So these things get carried forward for different reasons. And so we're very sensitive about our clients, about some of the issues that they face in in just in real life. And we try and and then we we're using that in the extension request. We're just making this is a real Think so. Either yeah, yeah, they don't know about it. it. Could be related to substance use. It could be memory issues. Many clients have PTSD. Um, they struggle with this memory. Some people, because of the trauma that they've gone through, through that experience, have put it off to the last minute. And then in July, it's like they they can't do the form because it brings up too much too much too many painful memories. So all of these things we're using as our reasons, uh, depending on on the client and what they're stating. 
Um, so now for barriers to the Indie Day School applications. So one of the main things is that it is complicated. Uh, many of the clients I uh, work with, they have they struggle reading. They may have dyslexia or some other forms of things that prevent them from understanding the forms. Even me, as someone who has a law degree, I get confused at the forms. Uh, the one main frustration I have is the levels of harm. So there's five levels of harm. And as I stated, uh, one is um, you just apply. You don't really need a lot of evidence other than that you did went to this, you did go to the school. Um, however, for levels two to five, you do need more evidence. And one of the main problems that I found was it, uh, how long it took to get certain pieces of evidence. If you made an ATIP request, that could take six to 12 months. And with COVID, it was even longer. So there's a lot of things that prevented individuals from getting access to those documents, further just the destruction of documents or other things where the client didn't know where those documents were. You know, uh, you can provide school records, school photos, school, anything to do with the schools. I don't think I saw one client who had any records uh, or wanted to keep any records that they went to those schools. Uh, many of the clients, uh, I've had quite a few clients that I'm the only person they've ever told their experience to. So these kind of barriers can be very complicated and prevent individuals from proving uh, to Deloitte that these their harms are indicative of the amount of compensation that they are to receive. Um, for example, when it comes to sexual abuse, um, level four is one incidence of penetration, whereas level five is multiple incidences of masturbation. To me, those are quite close things. And so um, it would be very tricky for me and other individuals at the clinic to decide, oh, is this a level four or is this a level five claim? Also, I've had clients be like, this is a, no, I want to apply for level one claim and I'm there like you could get a level three claim. However, they are so worried and so scared about uh, either whoever's looking at their application or the government or don't trust that they choose to do a lesser claim. And sadly, that is just something that we sometimes have to accept. Um, hopefully though, um, it is possible for the administrators to give a larger claim, a larger change the level and move it up if they see that these types of uh, their accounts are uh, should give them a higher claim. Um, so for us, when we write a narrative, we will try at everything we can to um, ensure that they get a higher claim. Uh, there was one time where one of our clients, Gloria and I worked with, and in the span of 30 minutes, uh, it was the only time she's came in, we were able to move her application from a level one to a level three claim. We still have not heard if she gets, she has gotten that. A lot of our clients don't call us to inform us uh, if their claim has come back or what they have. Sometimes we do. Um, so that's the thing. And also claims can be moved down, even if it's a level five to a level three. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the question is who was consulted? Um, when it came to these applications and the settlement as a whole. Um, it, based on my knowledge, uh, when phoning Indigenous uh, First Nations, um, I have talked to individuals who have stated I was part of the process in ensuring that on the Schedule K form that that school was there. And I worked with the federal government to, um, in some sorts, to put down... Um, yeah, to work with the federal government on creating those days. So to, in my, based on my understanding, there was, it wasn't just the federal government making all the decisions. It was a group of individuals. Um, I would say though, that I don't really have a lot of knowledge on that. Um, but in my own experience talking to nations, I have heard that they, that their representatives were actively working with the federal government to uh, ensure that these schools were on there. I will say, though, that I have phone nations who have said that those schools, that certain schools that I'm applying for or that I'm assisting my clients apply for were not federal NDA day schools. Um, however, my client expressed that certain things happened at those schools. And so also we did uh, do some applications for uh, 
we had numerous applications, I think around 10 that we assisted for one specific school that was not on the Schedule K. However, we had numerous, numerous people come into the clinic um, and state the exact same person who was doing uh, the harm, stated exactly what happened. However, that school was not on the Schedule K. Um, so it is unclear if there are schools missing um, or there are schools that could have been on it. Um, but yeah. In my grade four class, there was an Indigenous student who spent the entire year in a cupboard. His desk was moved into the cupboard. Um, we and myself were hit daily with yardsticks. But because that was a school just in school district 27, um, could they apply for abuse that happened there or? They could apply, but they would likely get rejected. I've also had clients come in who stated similar things. They have pictures of them at a school with all white individuals behind them. However, their class, their school was considered uh, a provincial school. And so they wouldn't, they wouldn't uh, be able to, they could apply, but they would, I'm, I'm almost certain they would get uh, rejected because it's not, it has to be on the schedule K, okay. even if it's a year off. I've had clients that were five, four, three, two, one year off, um, and they don't get it. I've had clients who've experienced abuse after the school was um, had, it's no longer on the schedule K. You can apply for those uh, sections of abuse. You can only apply for the sections of abuse that happened during those, that time period on that schedule K. Okay, thanks. I think someone over here had a question. Um, I just wanted to um, add what she was trying to ask is the process for applying for uh, the 60 Scoop and uh, Day School. Where did it originate from? Who created the process of the five levels and um, the registrations and also the ripple effect? is my question also um from applying for you know putting in these applications of opening pandora's box is it optional or mandatory for a client to seek um, mental health counseling um, because majority of the people that did put an application in um they are bringing up childhood trauma where it, you know, you're adding more fuel to the fire in regards to substance misuse, um, mental health, where they're embracing those uh, substance misuse. And also some of them are no longer with us since getting the settlement claim. Thank you. Um, I can answer the latter half of the question. Um, so yeah, in my experience, uh, the claims process has, can be very extremely traumatic for individuals. Um, one of the things that can also happen is individuals may not recount certain things and they're coming to my office informing me, oh, this happened, this happened, this happened. They go home, they remember an incident that happened. Um, and, and that's, it struggles for me because part of me is like, okay, I tell clients, make sure you keep a pen and paper with you to write down anything you have, but knowing that they're going home and there's there may be no safeguards there. Um, they do provide resources, but as I will say later, those are very static resources. It's very easy for you to look at a piece of paper and never interact with that. Um, further, I know I've had clients who are in the middle of substance abuse, and I don't know if that money from the settlement will kill them. If because now they have an extra couple, 10,000, 100,000, or we've had clients that have had their, that have brought in their, um, they don't have a bank. They brought in their money to their home and it was all stolen. So things like that happen. Uh, and it's very discouraging and disheartening. Um, but yeah, this this process can be is extremely difficult for certain clients, and 
I've had numerous clients who we've put in applications and they re get rejected. Um, and that can be even more discouraging them feeling that no one believes them or that what happened to them wasn't real. Um, and so those things can worsen, uh, especially if someone's either come to terms with it or um, just ignores it to, to deal with it um, because it's what they need for their safety. Bringing that back up can, can be like a tsunami of, you know, trauma that they now have to deal with. And, you know, there's free resources, which are already limited and already uh, underfunded and already exhausted. So those are the types of things that come that I've seen uh, and that I worry about when doing these applications. So I want to speak to the part of the question about um, who created the process. So as far as 60 Scoop goes, I, Klein Lawyers was the law group that was in charge of creating the process, and they gave over the administrating of the process to Collectiva, who we've probably all called many, many times. I find them easy to deal with on the phone. They're always very you know, cordial and give as much information as they can, but it's it's like there's no appeal process. There's no way to go above that level of the call center. I feel like we we never really get a definitive answer about something that is a hard issue. Like we have a client who's been waiting for a year. We sent in his status, his proof of status from the band. So he actually should have been deemed an eligible class member a year ago in like the fall of 2021 because we found we got him connected to his community. He has a status number they still have not made a decision, right? It's like, I cannot get beyond the call center. Um, I've contacted client lawyer. So for 60 Scoop, that is who is was responsible for the process. We don't know why they make clients prove this. I mean, in 60 Scoop, it's ridiculous. These are children who were taken away when they're five years old. They don't know. They can't prove anything about, you know, where their community is. It's It's absolutely totally it's it's just terrible what they're they're asking claimants to come up with right um school records and stuff no i mean it's it's next to impossible so we tell people walk through it the other thing about the federal um okay so federal indian day school class action the overriding group um the lawyers group who i think created the process is gowlings and then they've worked with deloitte and that is who is administrates it um, Deloitte is quite hard to communicate with. We really don't get them any answers. We've tried to find an appeal process. It's very difficult and we're just doing what we can. So, I mean, as much as possible, when I say read the settlement agreement, to me, that's where you may find other information. There may be something in there that is a loophole. Who knows? We, we've got, we have to read that to make sure that we can look after our clients. So, yeah, it was, you know, a group of people who, are non-Indigenous really who are creating the process and they're putting hardship on people who have already had a lot of hardship in their lives, making them retell a story. Um, they shouldn't have to do that. Like we don't agree with it. We're just doing what, I mean, we're just trying to make this happen for our clients. And I think it's very difficult. So we focus on really being compassionate with our clients. I've done a lot of interviews for the Federal Indian Day School Class Action. Some of my, many clients say, I have never told anybody this story before. I haven't told my family this. I mean, it's hard for them to talk about this, but we try and do it with as much compassion, kindness, um, it, because otherwise they're not going to get a level four and they deserve it. They all deserve it. every client. It comes in like at the beginning, I thought there would be more level. There was, there's no level ones. <laughs> There's no level ones. They should all be level four, level five, as far as I'm concerned. And so that's how our client, how our clinic has worked, is giving as much, getting as much as possible for the client because it's only a token. It's it's not enough. It's just it's just a little. It's just a smidge of the suffering that they've had to go through. But um, we just we're just trying to facilitate the best outcome for the clients as we can in the most kind and compassionate way that we can do it. I also, I did want to say that if you are phoning Deloitte, make sure you have the individual there with you. You will get nowhere 
even with you ha- if you have authorization forms or anything like that, you need the client physically present in the same well or able to talk to them either third party by phone, but you will not be able to get any answers um, unless it's maybe general questions. But if you have a specific question about an individual, there's no way they will allow give you anything regarding their specific file without them present or at least verbally present there. Yes. Do they, uh, okay. So that yes, the last three digits of the sin. I think we have a question in the back. I do, yeah. Oh, um, totally. um, going back to Schedule K, like it might be kind of a silly question, but if there is evidence and archives of maybe a school that was missed or like maybe the eligible years should have been different, like if there's evidence there, is there any way to amend the Schedule K or once it's filed, like it's filed? So we were working with a group of lawyers or a couple of lawyers and we, for the individuals I was previously talking about who went to the same school had similar narratives. Uh, we did create, I think it was a four or five or six page document outlining why those that school in specifics should be considered. Um, the problem is, is that, um, you know, when you have a bunch of people, it makes a lot of sense to be able to do that. However, when I have like one or two clients, I don't, we don't have the resources to be able to do the research necessary that they deserve in order to be able to write a document and whether they will accept the document is another thing. Um, you know, they, at the end of the day, Deloitte has final say, um, and I, like is all that hard work that was done i wouldn't i would never say is it going to be prevent someone else from getting an application in you know that's that's the thing um and with individuals who can't pay for uh legal services or do them themselves especially with a complicated process such as these class action lawsuits you know individuals you know may feel helpless and unable to even do the research also so much of I also do work applying for Indian status for individuals. And the, there's so many uh, documents that have either been purposely destroyed, you know, lost, aren't digitized, you know, and just that sheer amount of those documents aren't able to be found. So that's the other thing that uh, we struggle with is just documentation. And even when applying for ATIP, you know, there I've had certain things come back that we couldn't get access to, or did I word the ATIP correctly? Was I super specific? And was some document that could have been relevant, I didn't get it because of the way I worded it. So like, there's so many barriers that come with that. Yeah. Just speak to the sworn declaration, you said that a lot of success so yes, as part of the uh, application, uh, if you don't really have a lot of, if you don't have certain pieces of evidence, you can uh, sign a sworn declaration uh, confirming that everything you says is true. Um, these, This is a great tool and I'm very happy that it is in the application. Uh, for many of our clients, even if they do have all the documents or have a good number of documents, we still always get them to sign a sworn declaration. And the one benefit of our clinic is that we have lawyers as well as temporary articling students and articled students who can sign those sworn declarations, whereas individuals may need to get pay $40, $35 um, unless there's some legal advocate or lawyer who's doing that for free within their community. Um, also, the one benefit of everything being able to sign things online as well is individuals who were all over BC or Canada could uh, video conference in with us. And as long as they had a printer, we could have them sign it online. And then we stamp it saying, yes, we saw them sign it and we're approving this. And then that was another way that we could get those sworn declarations signed. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, like what are the silver linings to the Indian, Indian day school applications? So being able to tell their story, I had one client who told me their whole story and at the end of it, we weren't able to submit it because, or she didn't want to submit it because of some incidences and 
but she said how thankful she was that she finally got to tell someone how she finally was able to get that off of her chest. And, and she said how now she can, it, it'll help her move forward in life. Um, and so those are the benefits, so the, the silver linings um, to some of the applications, even if they don't result in an approved application. Also, I know individuals who are now using the money to send to their family to go take a trip home, especially I have clients who live in BC, but they may have family in other areas of the country. And so now they get to go home for Christmas. Now they get to go and spend time with their nieces, nephews, grandchildren. And so the money that they're getting from these applications can be used uh, towards that. Also, this can be the start of a process of dealing with trauma. Individuals, um, I have some individuals who are seeking counseling as well. And so this, they can start to work on those things. Um, but again, at what cost? These, this process is extremely traumatizing. Um, you know, in fact, just having to prove that certain things happen to you. And, and as, it, as we said, these are children. I have a lot of clients who said they remember blackness. They remember something up to a certain point and then they dissociate to protect themselves, but they don't remember the specific acts that happened. And so you can't put that in there. Um, I would have put in those that they don't remember. They know certain things happen, but they don't remember because of the trauma that was there. But then again, like, is are the applications, are the administrators wanting certain criteria that again, I'm not sure. Um, it's a very emotional thing and just, yeah, can be very traumatizing to the individuals. Um, so yeah, coming back to the extension. So the new extension is January 13th, 2023 at 11.59 p.m. So you have to complete it by that day. You can submit it before or submit it together with the claims form. Um, you have to have your SIN number and other identification numbers and your address. So make sure um, that the client that you're assisting either has some form of address. Some of our clients, they have their items mailed to our office, and then we will contact them. Or if they don't have a phone, they'll just come by or we'll send a letter to their house uh, or wherever they're living. Um, and so because that's so important, because if there's no address, they have nowhere to send it to. Um, so that's one of the things to remember. Um, so the extension criteria. So there's three things that you can put for an extension criteria. Now, this is all that's written on the form with regards to the extension. So you must check off the situation that most applies to you, persons under disability, undue hardship, or exceptional circumstances. Step two, please describe why you are not able to submit your claims form during the claims period. If you require additional space, please uh, attach pages. So this is kind of all that is there. Um, and there's nothing really else to go uh, off of. Uh, I have no idea what kind of things are under the umbrella of undue hardship or persons under disabilities or exceptional circumstances. So it can be very tricky uh, deciding what's allowable. And if you click check one of them, but Actually, the administrator says that it's, oh no, this is, it's this one. Will that be allowed? Um, I don't know. And so that's one of the problems with these extension criteria. I'm not sure if anyone else here has any more understanding of the extension criteria, has heard anything about what is allowable, but based on our experience at the clinic, there's very little information. I don't know of any claims that have gone through that have used the extension criteria and if they've been approved. So for now, it's just a wait and see. And yeah, just about this extension process. So the first, the first deadline of July 13, 2022, they had a huge influx of applications right at that time. And so when we've called to say, how long is it going to take to hear back a decision? They're, they're saying one year. So at this point, we know that anything that is in the last six months is coming after that, right? So it's it's going to be a waiting game. Anybody that's applying between July and January will probably have to wait upwards of a year in order to hear anything. So that's why we don't know because we've only submitted 
a handful of the extension criteria. I think I've done three or four. So we haven't really done that many. Actually, most, almost 100% of our files that were open files, we completed by July 13th. So we're now just dealing with a few, which is which is good, but we don't know what the timeline looks like. Um, so letters of administration. Um, this has been another big issue um, that these applications process has caused. So what letters of admin are is, so for individuals who didn't create wills, and many of the clients that I have that either applied and are now deceased or were applying as a representative, those they there was never a will created for that deceased person. So when there's no will, you have to go through this process um, of applying to the government, the BC government, to ask for an individual to become the administrator of an estate. So this is a new hurdle that we're having to deal with at the clinic. And maybe some of your clients may also have to deal with um, because also when filing the claims form, you have to provide evidence showing that you are the administrator of the estate or the executor or executrix of the estate. And so in doing so, individuals have to apply for the deceased relatives and get a bunch of documents. You have to do will searches, you have to do um, notice to creditors, you have to do, there's a whole sloth of things. And there's about five, six forms that you have to fill out and it can take a long process. Um, you have to inform everybody um, within the parameters of the Will Succession Act, who is uh, who is meant to get the application and everything is under that. Um, but again, for individuals who aren't familiar with the legal system um, or most people in Canada, this can be a very difficult thing for them to do. It's very complicated. It's very convoluted. If you make a nitty gritty mistake, you have to resubmit things with new forms. There's also fees associated with it. You have to spend, I think it's about $25 or $15 for uh, a death certificate, you, uh, $20 for a will search, $5 if they have any other aliases, um, and some other fees that go with it. Further, if it's uh, if there's assets above $25,000, there's a $200 filing fee that goes with it. Um, one of the other problems is, is that for class action lawsuit suits, when filing this, there's an undetermined amount of money. So you put, we, uh, I'm currently putting Indian day school application, uh, amount to be determined and whether that will be accepted is unsure. Um, I've heard people who have gotten approved with that people who haven't also, uh, many of the individuals who I'm working with, they don't have $200 right now to make these applications. Yes, sure, if they get that money, they'll have the money then, but currently they do not have the financial means to just give $200 to the government. Um, and so this can be another huge barrier. Also the amount of time you need to know um, for the people you have to give notice to. If you have a cousin or a sister or anyone who is MIA, you have to spend a lot of money trying to find them. And then if you don't find them, then you apply to the courts to get uh, an exception on servicing documents. And so this can be another process that is just another barrier for individuals. We've had individuals who, sadly, I say, we can't find this and we don't have, you need to hire a skip tracer and those can be a couple thousand dollars. And for most individuals who I've worked with, they don't have that money. And that time can be, uh, the one other thing is the time period. It can take up to four months just for the government to get through it. And that's not counting all the time that it would take uh, us or other individuals to fill out the forms and get all the information. And there's a 21 day period after you hand someone a P1 form. And so there's a lot of, it's very legal and it's very convoluted and individuals have expressed, I've, I've had clients getting really upset at the length of time it's taking. And we at the clinic are just starting these. We've done a few, but we have no one with an expertise on it. And so we're kind of in the dark, you know, hoping that um, it will get fast. But, uh, you know, if 
the government says, no, you need this extra piece of information. You didn't sign this form. We need this. That's more time that it's going to take to get those applications. And our current worry now is that individuals who've applied for a representative or the, re the claimant has passed away, those we won't get the letters of administration done by the time that they and and Deloitte will say no actually you can't uh we can't help you the uh application is denied so that's one of our worries I have no confirmation on if that will be done um but yeah and even there's a high demand for for these these applications and there are very few uh in my knowledge very few groups that are doing this with individuals um, and to do this many individuals need computers you need you need to be able to transport yourself you need to mail you know there's there's a lot of things extra barriers that come with these letters of administration um and they're long and convoluted and they put more stress on these individuals who are just trying to move on with their lives and yeah. Yes. So I'm just curious, like if there was someone that um, died before they received their claim and um, the client that was deceased didn't say anything to their family members. They just applied for it and the family didn't know. And you like, and then the family comes across it a year later and saw papers. Are like, how long is a family member allowed to do the letter administration process? So I don't think there's a time constraint on the letters of administration. Um, there could be. I, I don't have knowledge of that. Um, we'd, we'd have to look into that. Um, but based on my understanding, as long as no one's applied, you can apply for it. Um, and so individuals, we've done applications for individuals who have been deceased for quite a long time. Um, but yeah, that that is another thing that these forms don't take into account, and especially when you're on a deadline and there's stress. Those that's just another thing that do the people choose culture, or it's a choice that shouldn't have to be made. Um, and to go along with that, um, what was I going to say? Oh, I lost it. Um, yeah. So it's just the worry that so much unknown. For us in what's going to be allowed how long will they have um and yeah um so submission process okay so on the last page of both the claims form and the extension form there are actions that you can take and they describe how you can submit it so you can submit the applications by indian day school uh sorry at Indian Day Schools at Deloitte.ca. There's a fax number, you can mail it. Um, the one thing that I found is we tend to mail in, or sorry, email in all our applications. They give you a receipt, but they don't inform you what receipt that's to. So if you're sending in a bunch of applications, that doesn't say, okay, um, this is a confirmation for application uh, individual X. It just says, this is, thank you for submitting your application, blah, 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 blah. So there's no concrete, I would say there is, but there isn't concrete evidence that you did submit it. So it can be tricky, especially if you're submitting a lot of applications at once, make sure that you got confirmation emails for all the applications and not just a few. Um, so yeah, and now the time estimate. So due to the influx and and we at the clinic had a huge influx of applicants even on the last day i was we were writing till the very last day we had clients coming in um you know and so there were so many applications and in that time we were just th like trying to get it out the door especially with 
the extension process. You know, we didn't know what was going to be allowed, uh, how much of an extension was going to be given and, and all that. So for the time estimate, um, this, these, this info is from a year ago. So at that time it can take two to three months for level one. Um, but about 12 months for a level two to level five claims. I've had numerous individuals come into the clinic saying, I know person C and they got their money yesterday and they only waited a month or two months or three months. And this is a common thing that clients will come back with and clients start to get frustrated about why haven't I received my money? It's been six months. What are you doing? Why are you taking so long? Is it still there? And all that anxiety and worry and terror that, you know, is my application somewhere? Um, that can be really distraught, distraughting to an individual, um, but it, it can take a long amount of time. And that's one thing that I try to reiterate to my client numerous times that this is not a fast process. This will take time. I don't know how much time. You are more than welcome to come in to our clinic and call Deloitte and see if there are any updates. But at the end of the day, we have no say and we have no knowledge on what's happening to your claims form. Also, at the end of your Indian Day School application, there's a section you can either check mark to be destroyed, to be handed back to you, or sent to the, I think it's the Wellness Fund or the Legacy Fund. Um, I have phoned and like I did go on the website for the Legacy Fund. I don't know what it is. Um, I phoned Deloitte and asked questions. Um, that's also been an area that I have not had a lot of information on. Um, and so telling clients that I don't know exactly what's going to happen to that will be, is very taxing on the client. I've had numerous clients say, well, I want my story to be shared. So it helps other people. I want my voice to be there so other people can understand that what they're going through is valid. We have shared experience and, you know, not having that knowledge can be, you know, very uh, traumatizing an individual because they don't know who's going to get it. They don't know who's going to see it. Um, and so I've had clients who opt to either have it destroyed or sent back to them um, just because of the lack of information that is available um, or that is easily available. Um, this is a complicated process. Um, and so information can go missing or just be stopped. And so those individuals who may want to do something with it, aren't able to. Um, so mental health for advocates. So um, Gloria soon will be talking about wellness and whatnot, but I just wanted to say that it is so imperative and I cannot say with all my heart more that how important it is that you take care of yourself doing this. There were a couple of days when I was doing applications and I was just so done. I'd heard such horrible bone chilling things and it was so taxing and even today i'm still feeling the ramifications of doing these applications and that has nothing to do with the individuals who are telling me their story um it's 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 a traumatizing process for them and the way that it's set up we need to make sure that we take care of ourselves because if you're feeling burnout and you just keep on doing certain things, you may get real sick. And then instead of being able to do, okay, I'll cut my things back. So we'll only do two a day. Now you're doing none a day. So that's the thing is, is we are central to the process. And there are already so few of us that, you know, it can be very, it can feel selfish. It can feel excruciating to have to take, I can't do this. I, I need to take time. I need to just, you know, go to sleep, go for a walk go do something to make me happy. But that's, it's a central process, especially when dealing with these things. Um, so please do be careful, watch, make sure you're checking in on, you know, your advocates who are assisting you, you're working with, make sure you check in with yourself, check in with family, because, you know, we do great work and it's so important that we keep ourselves healthy so that we can continue to do the, the great work that is so necessary in our system. Um, so yeah, here is uh, one of the wellness helplines. Um, also on the claims form, there is um, there are indigenous wellness helplines you can call. I also tend to give uh, individuals who are in DC, um, the BC 
uh, Health Authority, First Nations Health Authority, um, information regarding mental health, uh, First Nations Health Authority, though busy, and I've been informed that sometimes it can be hard to get um, just due to the demand, um, does have free counseling available for all First Nations individuals in BC. Um, and so that can be a great resources. I myself ended up calling one of the wellness resources and it was, I talked to an amazing individual. Um, they had counseling in multiple indigenous languages in Canada. And so it was a great resource and they provided trauma informed indigenous cultural counseling that I found really beneficial for me and helped me be able to go from not able to do work to being back in the clinic and being able to do more applications. So please be aware that even though the resources are static, they, I, I found help. Um, and so they can be helpful if you need them and whatnot, but please do take care of yourself. Um, I will now pass uh, the mic off to Gloria, who will be talking about after. Thank you, Russell. That was really, really informative. Um, we Russell's part of the team that worked over the last, since June, he started articling and we all worked together. Um, really, the last six weeks before the Indian Day School are very critical. And the team, every member of the team felt um, felt the effects of of dealing with clients with trauma. And it's because of the accumulated stories. Um, you know, after you after you do one or two level four, level five narratives, it's that accumulation of the trauma that you're carrying from each person. And so it's really, really important to do um, to do your own wellness and to do that after like I'm going to talk about aftercare for a little bit, but this aftercare is specifically in relation to the two clients and to the client work. But um, what Russell was talking about right at the end with mental health, um, at the ICLC, what we did um, right after the Indian Day School files were done, we did a healing circle with all staff. We did a healing circle with all staff. And so we spent a time where we just, we, uh, we smudged, we went around the table, everybody talked about how did this affect me? And what was it like to work with hearing stories of, this kind of abuse. And that, I mean, we actually should have done a healing circle every week. You know, looking back, we, we realized we needed more support, more cultural support, and that would have been one of the ways to do it. So we tried to do those little things to help our mental health. And we realized that it was probably not enough because every one of the staff members at the ICLC went through just, we were tired. We were very exhausted. And in the summer, we just kept saying we have to look after ourselves and, you know, moving forward, does the ICLC want to take on a class action such as this? Are we equipped to do this work? Because there's so many trauma stories. And so, you know, you have to have these discussions with your coworkers. It's like, what can we handle? Do we have the training for this? Can we look after ourselves well enough to do this kind of work? Because it's really, really hard. Um, I, so about a year ago, September 2021, I was starting to feel a lot of burnout from doing narratives for Federal Indian Day School Class Action. And what I did is I um, I picked up a lot of resources about PTSD because I began to see this pattern. Every client that walked through the door had some sort of symptoms of PTSD. And so I felt that just by reading up on what it was getting a lot of resource books about it, having it available in the clinic for all of us to take advantage of. It helped us when you know your client well, when you know the symptoms of what the client is bringing into the office and you are, you're totally up on that. You've done some reading, you've, you know, you, you, you bring in resources for yourself, then you could better serve the client, but you also are protecting your own self through this healing process. Um, so I just, I really encourage you as whatever teams you're working with, always, you know, do, do the work of the healing circle afterwards, do the work of checking in with each other, having someone to debrief with. These are all really important things when you're working in, in class actions. And so 
the ICLC, we've done two major class actions back to back, which which was the 60 scoop and which was the Federal Indian Day School. They're both heavily focused on the narrative. Um, moving forward, we probably will work with additional class actions, but there has nothing really been announced at this point. We know that we know that the Millennium Scoop class action is just in the works of being determined. And so we don't really have any answers on what to do with that class action because it hasn't been established yet. The process isn't online yet. It's in the courts and it's coming up and we're waiting to hear. And so then moving forward with that, we will take the lessons learned from these previous class actions and then apply it to this next one that's coming on. Um, what I've got up here is called aftercare. What is it? And I just, I wrote down a bit of an, um, some notes about it. It says, aftercare is the work that lawyers and legal advocates do for the client once the file work is complete. This can mean any number of things to our clients. You may have helped a client complete an application form for one of the class actions. At the ICLC, when we open a class action file, what we agree to do is to help the client complete the application form, and then we close the file. The reason being, in any class action, the decision-making process takes so much time, and for the client, that's unknown. The administrator of the class, class action will only communicate with the client, and so we kind of, we let them fill it in, and then we, we let them, we close the file. Uh, for the majority of the clients, they leave happy. The application form is submitted, and the ICLC never hears anything about the matter again. Really, honestly, for 90% of our clients, once we've, once we've helped them complete this form, um, they don't, we don't hear. We don't hear whether they were awarded the money. Um, every once in a while, what we'll do is <clears throat> we'll go through the, the files that were closed a year ago, and we'll make phone calls to our clients and ask if they were awarded. So I did that two weeks ago, and I called four people. Three of them were given the award of level four or level five, and one of them um, was was still, they had not made a decision. So a year from putting in a class five, they had still not heard. So we take it upon ourselves to do that follow-up work. So that's uh, that's part of the aftercare. It's that the file's closed not on our open file list, but yet we still do work related to the, the open files that we've had previously. So um, the number one thing this is a very important thing is that updating contact information. On the application form, it's critical for the administrators of the class action to have the current and most up-to-date contact information for that client. It's because that is the person that is being given the award, the awarded money. This is where much time is spent. We have clients who drop by with new phone numbers, addresses, email addresses, etc. cetera. We, we take a lot of care to update our client information and, and then as well fax it or send it to the administrator. Um, in order for communication to happen about their claim form, um, it's very important that the contact information is up to date. Another um, thing is that we answer the client's questions about the process. And so everyone that we have helped apply over the last two years, if they haven't been awarded that money, occasionally we get phone calls from the clients and say, you know what, I haven't heard back from Deloitte. Do what? Have you heard anything? So. Deloitte doesn't communicate with us. We are, we are reteaching our clients over and over again that we are we are not in the loop. Whatever. So then I actually pull out the closed file. I walk the client through. This is the contact information on your file. Is this correct? So I take it as an opportunity to confirm that the client still lives in the same location, that they still have the same phone number. And then I say, you know what? It's just a waiting game. And so then I say, we estimate that it will be about this. And so we can have the same client coming in 12 times before they hear anything. And so we are always just considerate. We're kind. I go, I don't get impatient with them. I'm like, you know what? It we don't hear, but we will we'll look at your file. We'll see this is where the communication is going to happen. They're going to call you or they're going to mail you something. And then I say, if you receive a letter and they want more information, bring it back in because then we will continue to help you. So every file, we may have closed it, but if they receive, if they have to send in another piece of ID, whatever it would be, it could be status card, anything, we will help them do that. 
Um, communicating with the administrators. Um, we often get this question, are you counsel for the client? Um, a client comes in saying that Deloitte or Collectiva is questioning their application and all their documents. Uh, this happened about three weeks ago. I had a client who came in. Um, we had submitted a level five for him a year ago, and they were saying we didn't receive all the documents. Well, we have proof of that because I sent the original email. So what I do is I forward the original email so that they know it was sent on April 5th of 2021. And everything is, is again, confirmed because sometimes I feel like they just want to give the clients a runaround. And it's like, no, we did this work. It was sent in and this is not our mistake. This is, this is your mistake. Uh, this is something that has that still happens for 60 scoop. Um, well, actually, this is it's really winding down at this point, but we've had we had so much work related to supplemental claim forms, reason for late application submission, and supporting witness statements. Um, I had we had some clients that were sent the very same letter five times. We would help them uh, complete it every time. So you know, the, the file is closed, but Clients need our help, we help them. We just keep on helping them until they get the decision. And so we are we are in it with them till the end, whatever help that they need. Uh, for Indian Day School class action, it could be witness statements, the sworn declaration. Um, someone mentioned that before. We've had um, Deloitte come back to us and to our clients many times saying, you need to complete the sworn declaration. We complete the sworn declaration on 100% of every one of our files. And so it's it's like, it's very frustrating because it's like, you know what, we did this work and we did it when we submitted it the first time. And so, you know what, we do it again. We just, whatever they ask for, we do it. It's frustrating, but I do. Yes. <laughs> it's like, we did this and yeah. And but, but here we, here you go. <laughs> That's right. You know, and it's like, yeah, it's very frustrating because it takes it, all of these little details take a lot of work and they do take time. And so this is what I mean by aftercare. It's like the file is not closed really until the client is awarded that money from, from whatever level that they have applied for. Um, I put this one up, mental health services in, in relation to our client work. We, we try and find as many resources as we can for our clients. And like Russell was saying, um, the phone number that was written there for the wellness line, I've called that phone. Um, I try and research when there's a phone on an application form, I call every number because I want to know what is that experience going to be like for the client? Who is that person on the phone? When I called the wellness line, they were great. It's like, these people are really good. They're, they're trained, they're friendly. And they helped me and they answered all my questions, right? And so I pre I do the research for the client even before I give them any phone number, just because I want to know that I'm giving them information that is true and correct and that will be helpful because it's a 24-hour line, which means if you're having a crisis at midnight, that might be the only thing, place you can call. And so it is important to have that as a resource. Um, I have something here about burnout from extensive trauma work. I was referring to that a, a little bit ago. Um, the client whose stories include all of these types of abuse, um, it's very concerning in the office setting. And we uh, we just work very hard to support each other through this process. And that we are actually, um, everything that we're doing is lessons learned. So, you know, whenever we do a file, whenever we do a claim form, we may look back and we we think to ourselves, I could have done this differently or I could have done that differently. It's a lesson learned. So everything you're doing, evaluate your own work. Evaluate the processes you do with clients because that's how you grow and change as an advocate. That's how you increase your skills. This is all lessons learned. For the ICLC, we've done these two class actions. It's been huge. A lot of lessons learned. We did make mistakes with clients, but we've we've pushed through all of that. And I feel like our client service, it gets better and better and better. We're more aware. We're more aware of our clients' needs. We try and support each other in more ways because we're learning these lessons and we're, we're moving forward with that. Um, I just want to say that like you as advocates can only do the best you can with the knowledge you have at the time you're doing it. So please do not beat yourself up if you're looking a year, six months, 
after something's happened and say, oh, I should have known this. No, you, you, there was no way you could have. So please be gentle with yourselves. Um, I know just for me, it can be very difficult for me to say, I'm not okay. I need to take time because I feel shamed and that I should be assisting clients. People need me. And so the, the idea around, you know, your own mental health and you being okay, the conversation around mental health is beginning, but just know it's okay not to be okay. You know, be gentle on yourself and try to try to be gentle on others uh, who, who are struggling because this work can be really taxing and some people can deal with it. Everyone has different abilities when dealing with this. And so just know because person Z can do 25 applications in one week, that doesn't mean that you have to do 25 applications in a week. If you are doing one application a week and that's good enough for you, that's that's one application that someone's getting assistance on that wouldn't have gotten assistance if you weren't there helping them. So please be gentle on yourself, be kind to yourself because the work you do is so important. And without you, that work would never have been done in the first place. So I just wanted to say about um, about the ICLC, this trauma work, it's really heavy work. It's very, uh, it's very, very sobering and it's really serious when we're dealing with clients. We spend time at the clinic having a lot of fun. That is our way of recovering from things. We work, there's a lot of craziness that goes on. We have a lot of different personalities at the ICLC and we have a really good time in the office and that is a huge support. So I know that um, you're doing that as well within your offices. Have Make time to have fun because it's through the humor and through the lightness that you can actually do heavy work, right? If we weren't able to come out of that and to focus on the positive, it, it, would, it would be impossible. But but that's what we do. I, I love going to work in the morning. I feel like, you know, Russell's going to make me laugh. He's crazy. And it's hilarious, right? If you knew how, about working with Russell, you would love it. It's like we need a Russell in every office in, in BC because he's just a beautiful person to work with. So I really appreciate my coworker. He helped me do this um, presentation today. Feel free to ask us any questions about this. Um, we've had we've had questions throughout the process, which is very good. Um, another thing. Our website um, on the resources page includes all of the class actions. And as everything comes up, we try and update that website. We have the water class action on that website. We have the millennial scoop class action. Um, and as soon as we know more information, we will be updating that, that web page with everything that we've, that we've talked about. Because we haven't gone into great detail about anything, really any, any of the forward ones, but what's already done it's, it's it's all there so thank you and uh yeah. um thank you yes i'm very grateful to be working at the iclc and to have co-workers like blair we have a good lot of laughs and we try to you know bring everyone together because as laura said this is difficult work and you can't do it alone um or at least i couldn't um so it's important to have family like uh like gloria and so thank you so much for coming um if you have any questions and thank you we appreciate you being here